Good. Good. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and our honored guest, Chief Justice John G. Roberts, Jr. It is a privilege and great honor to have Chief Justice Roberts as our honored guest tonight. I know that our students and faculty here at New England Law Boston have been thrilled to meet with Chief Justice Roberts over the past two days, and all of us have been looking forward to this chance to hear his views on a variety of issues. But before we begin, the conversation and on behalf of our entire community, I thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, for being so generous with your time in visiting New England Law Boston. Not at all. Thank you. All right, I've read some surveys that have caught my attention. One from the Annenberg Center at the University of Pennsylvania shortly after you were confirmed. It pointed out that 15% of those polled could identify you as Chief Justice. That's interesting. That's a big number. 66% could identify at least one judge from American Idol. <laughs> More recently, a survey by the American Council of Trustees and Alumni of four-year educated college Americans found that a significant number, 10%, identified Judge Judy as a member of the US Supreme Court. <laughs> so, how's she doing? <laughs> yeah, she's doing great, she's doing great. Uh, S seriously, what do you make of this lack of knowledge of the court, and it, does it concern you? Well, it frankly doesn't bother me very much that people can't identify who the particular members of the court uh, are. One reason we wear black robes is because we should be anonymous and uh, uh, simply articulating what the law is and not occupy any role in which our personality is, is pertinent. So that part doesn't bother me. What does concern me, and I know concerns a lot of the other members of the court, is that people don't have a very good understanding of what the court does. In particular, um, uh, they don't have a good understanding of how we're different than the political branches uh, of government. People, when we issue a decision, it's usually uh, discussed as, oh, you're in you're in favor of this or you're in favor of that, when in fact our ruling often is that whoever does get to decide this or that is allowed to do it and it's not unconstitutional, or it's consistent with law, but uh, we often have no policy views on the matter uh, at all. And that's a very important distinction uh, between how we function and I think it's one that people often lose, uh, lose sight of. During your confirmation hearings, it seemed you were more than candid in discussing your views as to the proper role of a judge, yet others have described the confirmation process as less than edifying. Uh, why is that, do you think? Well, I do think it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure that the Senate particularly cares what I think about it, but uh, <laughs> I, I do think the process is not functioning very well. I mean, you look at Two of my colleagues, uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg, for example, I think they were confirmed, maybe there were two or three dissenting votes uh, between the two of them. Now you look at my more recent colleagues, uh, all extremely well qualified for the court, and the votes were, I think, strictly on party lines uh, uh, for the last three of them, or close, close to it, and that, that doesn't make any sense. That, suggests to me that the process is being used for something other than ensuring the qualifications of the, of the nominees. It's a process now where the members of the committee frequently ask questions they know it would be inappropriate for us to answer. Thankfully, uh, we don't answer the questions. Um, and it's a forum, I think, they have different, and a different agenda uh, uh, when they participate in the hearings. Um, it's not something, uh, it's easy for us to change. Uh, I don't see how we would do that. It, it's certainly up to them to conduct the hearings as they, see, as they see fit, but it doesn't seem to me to be very productive 
these days. And there's a problem with the way it comes out, and it, it sort of relates to my first uh, answer. Uh, when you have a sharply political, divisive hearing process, it increases the danger that whoever comes out of it will be viewed in those terms. You know, if, if the Democrats and Republicans have been fighting so fiercely about whether you're going to be confirmed, it's natural for some member of the public to think, well, you must be identified uh, in a particular way as a result of that process. And that's just not how, uh, uh, you know, we don't work as Democrats or Republicans, and I think it's a very unfortunate perception that the public might get from the confirmation process. Well, whether it's the confirmation process or occasionally campaigning, sometimes the process seems uh, more like speech making and sometimes criticism of either the nominee or the court itself. And uh, as the leader of the court, does that trouble you? And are you ever tempted to reply to, or to respond to some of these criticisms? Um, criticism of the court doesn't bother me at all. Um, and uh, I, I think that's important because it's a big part of our job really not to care what people think about what we do, at least in terms of the merits uh, of, the, uh, uh, of our, our decisions. Now, if people object to how the court's being run or, 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 or something like that, that's, that's something else. And I, I certainly have no trouble uh, with people doing that. But again, it's often based on a, a, a misunderstanding or a calculated uh, uh, perception about what we're up to. I mean, if we uphold a particular political decision, um, that remains the decision of the political branches. And the fact that it may uh, lead to criticism of us uh, is often uh, a mistake. And we, we do have to be uh, above or apart from uh, the criticism because we, of course, make unpopular decisions, very unpopular decisions. A case like you know, the Westboro Baptist case, which involved uh, a group that in engaged in some very vile speech at military funerals, um, the sort of thing that I think most people would agree is was just, just awful. And yet, you know, the court, I think by a very comfortable margin, maybe it was eight to one, um, said that that type of activity, it was on a public sidewalk, uh, um, uh, was protected by the First Amendment. Now, that is certainly something the court can expect to get criticized uh, about a lot, and it's something we have, uh, it's the reason we have life tenure, so that we're not susceptible to being swayed by that sort of, uh, sort of criticism. Um, uh, so uh, the criticism doesn't bother me, partly because the framers established the court in a way that we could be, uh, 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 could not care about the criticism and also because I think sometimes it's based on a misperception of what our job is as opposed to what the job of the political branches is. And just a little bit <clears throat> following up on that kind of misperception, when one of your colleagues, Justice Scalia, was here, he told uh, what I thought was an amusing story about the time when the court found uh, that flag burning was protected speech. And as much as it horrified him personally, uh, he agreed with, uh, I think, the vast majority of the court that this was, in fact, protected speech. But for the life of him, it was important. He, didn't, he couldn't stand the thought of flag burning, and he would, hoped no one else would think that he would be thinking along those lines. The reason it was an amusing story is because he said after he tortured himself with this, the next morning uh, his wife, Mrs. Scalia, came down for breakfast humming, it's a grand old flag. <laughs> yes. does, it, does, it con does it concern you sometimes that people mistake your applying the Constitution to a set of facts and maybe not understanding that these aren't necessarily your own views. Well, it does, of course. I mean, I uh, uh, issue a lot of opinions um, where if I were in the legislature, um, I certainly wouldn't have voted for the program that was uh, uh, 
under review. Um, uh, I don't necessarily agree with the substance of every piece of legislation if I, simply because I determine that it's within the Constitution for Congress to enact it. But I don't think everybody, uh, uh, you know, you say people don't recognize who the members of the court are. Well, that's not a problem. But it is a problem that many people don't appreciate how our job differs from the job of people in the uh, executive or legislative branches. Can we talk a little bit about leadership? Following your confirmation, how difficult was it for you to pick up the reins of leadership in relation to this group of eight other very strong-willed, independent people? Well, I, I did learn um, uh, early on that when you're holding the reins of leadership, you should be careful not to tug on them too much. You'll find out that they're not connected to anything. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, well, I mean, as you might imagine, it was a matter of some concern. I had for 25 years been arguing in front of the court and literally uh, looked up to them. Um, they had been together as a group for 11 years without any change. I was coming in as the youngest member of the court with the least amount of judicial experience um, and coming in as the Chief Justice. So naturally I was not quite sure how it was going to work out. But all eight of them uh, uh, at the time were extremely supportive. Um, I don't think it had much to do with me personally, but rather a, a, an understanding that sort of somebody has to fill this role, whether it's moderating the discussion at conference or, or, any, or anything else, and they were very, uh, very supportive uh, from the beginning. It is a tough position in terms of, of leadership. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure none of them regard me as their boss. Uh, and, and, um, and yeah, well, maybe it is the same. It's, it's kind of hard, um, uh, you know, you can't fire them uh, or, 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 or dock their pay. Uh, so any notion of leadership has to be a little more subtle and done through um, uh, persuasion. Uh, and, you know, the other members of the court are, are leaders as well. Um, you know, Justice Scalia has been there for such a long time that he is a leader by virtue of his experience, and others carry out a lot of that role uh, uh, as well. So it is very much a collegial group. We're obviously all equals when it comes to discharging our, our constitutional responsibilities, um, and uh, any leadership that I'm able to exercise is really only with the support of the other members of the court. Chief Justice Roberts, you've talked about the value of consensus uh, in the court's decisions. Again, with these strong-willed, independent people, many people thought aiming for consensus was like dreaming the impossible dream. Uh, can you talk about the value of consensus to you and whether that remains one of your goals? Well, I think, um, I think the public, but also the lawyers, I think appreciate that if you have a decision that is say, you know, nine to nothing or eight to one, it carries more weight and force than a decision that's five to four, or even worse, that's, you know, four to affirm a plurality for something else and dissents here. Um, I think it's natural for a member of the public to look like, well, if you can't, can't get together and agree on what the answer is, why are we supposed to have such great confidence that, that you've gotten, uh, gotten it right? And for lawyers and practicing, uh, uh, practicing attorneys and judges, it's kind of hard for them sometimes, too, to uh, figure out what the court's up to when it's splintered like that. Now, I do think it's worth trying to get broader agreement. You do it by sometimes talking about issues a little bit more than, than, than otherwise to try to get people to see everybody's point of view, and maybe that causes people to, uh, to come around. But it, it's not something you, can, you can't compromise the way you can in the legislature. I mean, if Justice A thinks something violates the Fourth Amendment and Justice B thinks it doesn't, you can't sort of meet halfway. I mean, it either does or it doesn't. Um, uh, so in some areas, you, you certainly, I'm not suggesting, and wasn't when I talked about that, that judges should compromise their conclusion about what the law requires after careful consideration. I think careful consideration might lead to a broader uh, agreement. And how you shape a decision can also have that same effect. 
uh, uh, disagreement might emerge only when you get to a particular level of decision. If you can decide just a simple case that's familiar to lawyers, if you can decide a case on a statutory ground or a constitutional ground, it always, always makes sense to decide it on the basis of the statute, and perhaps that's an area where you can get a broader agreement. Um, if you make a decision narrow, perhaps people can sign on to a narrower resolution, but if you decide to issue a decision more broadly, that's when you people start saying, well, I'm not quite prepared to go that far. And so I think it's a good idea to consider whether it makes sense to decide it on the narrower ground if you can get more agreement. Well, I certainly, it seems to me, that there is a lot more consensus uh, than sometimes some in the media might have you believe. Uh, the five to four decisions are certainly here and there. But in focusing just on those five to four decisions, do you think there's a misperception as to just how much consensus there really is on the court? Uh, I do. You know, more of our decisions are nine to nothing than anything else. Uh, I, you know, and the number varies. Some years it's 45 percent, other years something else. But we agree entirely more often than anything else. And if you throw in the eight to ones and seven twos, it's a big chunk where we generally agree across the board. Now obviously you can look at what our docket is like and the cases that are on it, and I think you're gonna realize that you know, we're not all going to agree on a lot of the issues that are, are, are before us. Um, but yes, and you know, the ones we disagree tend to be, uh, where we disagree tend to be the ones that tend to be the sort of hot button issues that people focus on. So they must think that you know, we're at each other's throats and narrowly divided uh, uh, throughout the year when that's not at all the case. I'm just wondering whether you see yourself as having a leadership style. You clerk for Chief Justice Rehnquist, and I think you've said uh, to our students in the last few days uh, that you learned a great deal from him. Do you see yourself having a certain style, and if so, does it uh, differ in your view from some of your predecessors? Well, I know it differs from many of them. Um, um, I've done, done some reading recently about Charles Evans Hughes, and what Frankfurter said about him is, you know, he looks like God and he spoke like God. <laughs> I'm pretty sure no one's ever said that. <laughs> About, about me, and I'm quite sure none of my colleagues have ever, ever said that. Uh, you know, Chief Justice Rehnquist, uh, first of all, he was beloved by the members of the court. Um, uh, they all admired him for his leadership ability. Justice Ginsburg um, uh, said that he was the best boss she ever had. She says that a little more frequently for my... Uh, and. and <laughs> I've heard her say it several times uh, <laughs> lately, but, and he, I think, generally led with a, a pretty soft touch. Um, uh, you know, you have to appreciate what things are appropriate, and it's in many ways unwritten what things it's appropriate for a chief justice to decide uh, uh, on, on his own, and what things need to be submitted to the conference as a whole uh, uh, for a vote, and you know, you try to be careful uh, uh, in that respect, you do have to appreciate, as I mentioned earlier, you're not a, at all a boss in the usual, uh, uh, usual sense. And Chief Justice Rehnquist, I think, had a good sense of you know, when he should exert uh, and assert his, his authority as chief and when, it, uh, when he shouldn't. And you know, that's something you try to be careful about. One of the things that I think the faculty is still talking about is something that we all learned at lunch when you were kind enough to have lunch with the faculty today, and that is your role with the Smithsonian. And I think that's something very few of us know about. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about that? Well, it, it might come as a surprise to many people, but the Chief Justice, by virtue of his office, is also something called the Chancellor of the Smithsonian, um, which is an even better sounding title than Chief Justice. It's, <laughs> and um, uh, there's some odd historical reasons why that is so. Uh, but part of the reason, I think, is that you have a Board of Regents that administers James Smithson's trust, as well as the federal appropriations, um, and they serve for a limited 
time, and they wanted somebody there who would have you know, continuity and could tell the new regents, well, you know, when you make this decision, you need to know that 12 years ago, this is what, what happened. It's certainly not because I have any expertise or experience in uh, research or curatorial sciences. Uh, the Smithsonian is the largest research and museum complex in the world. And the idea that they would turn that over to me is kind of a surprise. <laughs> but, um, uh, and it's not an ex officio job. I do preside at the meetings and, and uh, I try to stay out of the purely policy areas and let the people who know uh, what they're talking about discuss it. But it's, um, it's a fun thing. It takes a lot of, it takes more work than, than I had expected, but it's a nice distraction from the legal work. If I may, let's talk a little bit about collegiality among the members of the court. If particularly after a five to four decision, you listen to the media and maybe even read some of the dissents, <clears throat> you would think that the members of the court are constantly at one another's throat. Yet we've been fortunate enough to have uh, six justices from the court come in recent years here and every single one of them who has visited New England Law Boston talk about the great respect and affection that they have for one another. Uh, is that your experience? Is that something that you try and foster yourself? Um, it's, it's certainly my experience and something I was very happy to discover when I came on uh, the court. You know, we, they, we are nine very, um, uh, we have strong views on very important issues, um, and we have to sit down and discuss those and reach some type of a resolution. Um, and, you know, obviously on a lot of these cases, important ones, we're not all uh, in agreement. Um, but uh, as we all like to say, uh, in the conference room where we meet, long table with nine chairs around it, uh, we've had very serious discussion. We have sometimes pointed disagreements, but there has never been a voice raised in anger uh, in that room. Um, uh, partly because um, of, of the nature of being a, a group that is thrown together to decide these very important questions for an indeterminate period. Um, I mean, if you just think about it, think, pick nine random people out of the room, uh, throw them in a room and say, okay, you will be working together for the next 25 years on some of the most important and divisive issues the country faces. I mean, naturally almost, you immediately come to the realization that you can't end up shouting at each other every time you decide one of those issues. It's, it's more of a, a long-term relationship, um, and you do come to appreciate the good faith of the people with whom you work. Um, uh, that's certainly been, been my experience. You know, if you're gonna have a knockdown, drag out fight over a big case this year, you need to understand there are gonna be several more of those the next year and several more of them the next year. And in fact, the process of having to decide those cases and reason through them is, really has a, a bonding effect, even when you find out that you're on opposite sides of the issue. It's a very unusual thing on the court um, unlike most, most jobs or other situations, very rarely do people do the exact same thing. Even if you're in the same department of a corporation or whatever, you know, you are responsible for different areas or whatever, you know, your, your faculty members working together, but you're teaching different things. The nine of us uh, have the same job, take the same oath, read the same cases, read the same briefs, go to the same arguments, and are, are tasked with coming out with decisions. So there is a strong bond that develops uh, uh, among the colleagues. We're very supportive uh, of each other. Now, I understand that that doesn't always shine through in some of our opinions, uh, uh, and that's more a writing of the, you know, a matter of style for uh, some justices. And the one thing I will say is that it's an awfully good thing that we get away from each other in July and August. Uh, uh, Justice, uh, Justice Brandeis said he could do the 12 months worth of work in 10 months, but he couldn't do it in 12 months. And uh, I think there was a lot of wisdom behind that. But also it's just, all that aside, it's just a wonderful collection of 
individuals. And it's often, there, nobody on that court is like anybody else on that court. Um, uh, they're, 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 it's a fascinating group. Uh, they come um, uh, at very diverse interests. Um, and it's, it's a real honor and pleasure to be able to work with them most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned opinions a moment ago, and in crafting an opinion, I'm very curious as to uh, what's your intention? Who are you writing for? Is it, obviously it's the parties, lawyers, law students of the future, some of these college-educated Judge Judy fans, who are, you, <laughs> who are you writing for when you're crafting your opinion? Um, well, I like to think of it as I'm, I'm writing for my sisters. I have three sisters, none of them uh, are, uh, are, are lawyers, it's a lawyer, um, and yet they're intelligent lay people that you know, have active and busy lives that don't necessarily involve the government, but they keep up with what's going on. And um, I like to think that they could pick up one of my opinions and be able to read it and understand what the issue is, understand how it's been resolved, and understand a you know, general view of, of how. I mean, the reason we write our opinions is because we have to justify the uh, anti-democratic position in which we're in. Um, you know, if you don't like what the president is doing, you can throw him out of office. If you don't like what your congressman is doing, you can throw him or her out of office. If you don't like what we're doing, it's too bad. Uh, and, and, and because of that, I, because of that, this process is developed that we have to justify ourselves. We have to explain to you why we've issued this decision. You know, the Congress doesn't have to explain to anybody why they're, you know, pursuing a certain course. The president doesn't have to explain the actions he's taking. I mean, they obviously do, but, you know, they're entitled to do what they do because the people have elected them. We're entitled to do what we do because we're interpreting the law and not imposing our own views. And to make sure that's the case, we explain it to you. And I'd like to think that intelligent lay people can understand that explanation. And if people don't like the explanation or don't think it holds together, you know, then they're justified, I think, in viewing uh, us as having you know, transgressed the limits on our, on our role. But, so I write for people who aren't necessarily lawyers, um, uh, who, but who do follow public affairs and, and can, can read the opinions intelligently. Um, you know, there's no reason to think that's necessarily the right answer. I, I think my colleagues have different views about it. You could be writing for the lawyers so that if it's in a particular area of law, you feel comfortable using the legal terms and the background principles. Um, you could be writing for the academy. In other words, they're the ones who spend a lot of time reviewing our work, and you want them to understand at, at a particular level what, why we've done what we've done. But I, I like to think, and I'm sure it's not true in every case, but I like to think somebody who's not a lawyer but is a thoughtful person can pick up an opinion and read it, you know, and not necessarily follow all the nuances, but I have a good idea about what was at issue and what was decided. Chief Justice Roberts, in reading your opinions, you seem committed to clarity, but also to keep it interesting for the reader. For instance, in a case described by the New York Times as, quote, an achingly boring dispute between telephone companies, <laughs> you livened up your dissent by suggesting a lack of standing, quoting Bob Dylan, uh, one of my favorites, by pointing out, when you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. <laughs> what was your objective in quoting Bob Dylan? Well, uh, it's consistent with what I said earlier. I think an intelligent layperson appreciates uh, Bob Dylan's po <laughs> his poetry, if not his music. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, you know, it was. And second of all, it was, after all, in a dissent. So uh, that's a little bit. You have a little bit more leeway there. Um, and it. It, it may have been achingly dull to the reporter, but it was very important to me. It was a very important standing decision. I wouldn't have dissented if I didn't think it was uh, uh, important. And, you know, 
Bob Dylan captured the whole notion behind standing and what was at issue there when he said, if, if you don't have anything, you've got nothing to lose. And in that case, the, 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 you know, the party uh, had, didn't have any stake in the case and had nothing to lose, and the case should have been thrown out on that basis. I, I'm no, I know Bob Dylan would have agreed with that. <laughs> But you did clean up his language because the original language was the double negative. Well, you, when you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Well, actually, I did get into a little bit of discussion about that with somebody. That, that is as performed. The liner notes show that it do doesn't have the ain't in it. So um, I'm, a bit of a, a, I'm a bit of a textualist, so I went with the... <laughs> The, the liner notes. <laughs> if not an originalist. <laughs> Are there justices who, particularly, who you particularly admire for their writing? Uh, anyone in the past that comes to mind for you? Well, yes. Um, and I think many of the, the judges uh, here uh, would have the same answer, and certainly a lot of the justices. Robert Jackson is probably, at least in the modern era, you know, the most eloquent craftsman. Um, he reads passages that you just, the sort of things when you put it and you say, but I wish I could do that. Um, and most of us, most of us can't. But mostly because he has a very good eye and, and understands how things relate to other things in the world. He has this great passage, it's a, it's a uh, First Amendment religion clause case. And he doesn't just go through the precedents, but he's making the point and he says, well, you know, what would architecture be like without the cathedral or painting without you know re religious concepts and music without you know the religious masses and he makes a particular point about you know the case that was before him but he's able to draw on all those experiences that are familiar to people and again it would speak to somebody who doesn't necessarily know about the law but would appreciate the point he was making about in in that in that case so he's a very uh, eloquent writer and it's 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 nice to come upon one of his opinions and, and read it. But you know, the other thing is someone like John Marshall, his opinions are very accessible. Um, uh, you know, you think Marbury versus Madison, you know, it's the old style print and the pages are faded and it's so long. But when you sit down and read it, it's something anybody can understand. Um, uh, it, it's very, very uh, clear. It wasn't until this period in the late 19th century and early where judges in particular think, you know, the opinion wasn't legitimate if it didn't have 24 whereases and heretofores and all that in. So um, uh, there are a lot of good writers out there, and it's, it's uh, you know, I think it improves the understanding of their legal judgment and its accessibility uh, uh, when they have that skill. If we can talk just a little bit about you, Chief Justice Roberts, in high school, you were captain of the football team. Um, <laughs> what, what? That was a very, I do have to, <laughs> you do, there, there were, there were 20, 24 boys in my graduating class, so. <laughs> Half of them were on the soccer team, so it was. Uh, <laughs> so why the law over the NFL? <laughs> oh, no, I did expect to be, uh, my original ambition was to be the halfback for the Chicago Bears, but somebody, somebody named Gail Sayers already had the job, and so, so I thought. No, it was, it, as I said, it was a very, we were in fact the, the smallest high school that played football uh, in the state of Indiana, so, you know, it, it wasn't that hard to be the captain. <laughs> You're regarded as one of the finest advocates of our time, arguing 39 times in front of the Supreme Court in the decade before being confirmed for a seat on the DC Circuit. Any advice for our New England Law Boston uh, students and alumni about preparing and conducting an oral argument? Um, yes, I mean the one thing I would say is I would be a much better oral advocate and brief writer uh, today than I was before I became a judge. You really do get a very different perspective on the process when you're on the other side of the, uh, 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 of the, of the bench. Um, brief writing is very easy. I, I, I was talking uh, about this with the students. The, the page limit in the Supreme Court is about 50 pages. I mean, we do the word count. 
because uh, we got tired of lawyers, you know, scrunching everything in. <laughs> but it comes out to about 50 pages. And when you're getting ready for, you know, you pick up the first brief and it's 50 pages. You know, you pick up the respondent's brief and it's 50 pages. You go to the next case, the brief, it's 50 pages. The next one's 50 pages, 50 pages. All of a sudden you pick up one and it's 35 pages. I mean, can you imagine the impact of that? I mean, you're, <laughs> you're the lawyer, you're trying to reach the judges, Really, can you imagine that? You, it's 35 pages. The first thing you do is turn it over and look at the cover, find out you know, who your new best friend in the bar is. Uh, <laughs> but then you also, you also realize that she probably has a good case. It only takes her 35 pages, and she's done. She must have a lot of confidence in the strength of her, her argument. The second thing you realize, you're going to read those 35 pages very, very carefully because you know that you know, she went to the trouble of distilling it in a way that there obviously can't be a lot of fluff to it, so you're gonna read it more carefully. Um, so it, judges say it all the time, and people think, oh, it's because they don't wanna work so hard, but no, it's a very good idea uh, tactically to put your, and, and think about, I, I look at it as if you really can't explain why you should win in 35 pages, do you really think you need the additional 15 pages? Um, um, and if you don't, then it does hurt you to have them. And uh, so I think that's very important. It's hard. It's hard for lawyers. Uh, any, I mean, I've you know, sp spent many years having clients. And, and, and by the way, don't check my briefs and see how many pages they were. <laughs> this, is, this is something I learned, not necessarily something I did. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, it's hard to explain to a client when you give them this is what we're going to file in court. They're going to say, no, I paid for 50 pages. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're shortchanging me, but you have to have the professionalism and the confidence to say, look, you hired me to handle this for you. I think we have a better chance if it's not, you know, if it's 35 pages instead of 50. And on the oral advocacy part, um, again, it's the same sort of thing. Everybody tells you, you know, don't avoid the questions that the judges want to ask, but you really have to take that seriously. You don't need the wind up. If a judge is asking one of the lawyers a question, it's probably not a comfortable question. It's something they want to try to draw out, point out a flaw in your argument, get you to explain it. But wel welcome the question. I mean, John W. Davis said that in a famous piece. You know the judge is concerned about that, and you're given the chance to address it. But do it directly. Um, you know, if somebody says, well, in this case, whatever, didn't the person in the same position as your client raise the same argument, and that was rejected, right? If it was, say yes. I mean, as soon as you say yes, the, the judge is going to listen to what you have to say about it. As soon as you say, oh, no, 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 that person was very different for this obscure reason that doesn't have anything to do with the line of argument you're trying to make, um, the judge immediately says, all right, now I've got to, you know, pry out of this lawyer what their position is on this particular case. You know, he or she is not going to give me a straight answer about it. You develop an immediate hostile relationship uh, as opposed to being in a position where the judge says, okay, this person understands we're both engaged in this process. He's going to help me out uh, uh, with this answer. He's obviously going to you know, respond in a particular way that helps his client, but at least he's not fighting the question. Uh, you don't, it's not good when you, you leave as a lawyer and say, oh, this was great, I had this big problem in my case and I didn't get a question about it. Well, that means you haven't given, have been given an opportunity to tell the court what your answer to the problem is. What are some of the attributes or qualities, uh, I know this is a difficult, Question, but uh, that President Bush saw that led to his nominating you to be our Chief Justice? Um, I don't know, to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I don't know, but I do know that he gave it a lot of thought. I went to the interview process with him was um, uh, very uplifting for me not because of how it worked out at the end. Frankly, at the end of the interview, I certainly I didn't expect it to work out the way it did, but I was very impressed with his understanding of the proper role of the courts uh, in the government and, and uh, uh, his general view of the responsibility on, uh, on him. 
there's always, a, there's a, seems to be a strange and unusual story behind every appointment of the Chief Justice. Uh, uh, John Marshall, for example, of course he was not uh, John Adams' first choice. Uh, John Jay was. Uh, it was the time when the Jeffersonians had taken over. Jefferson was about to be inaugurated. Oliver Ellsworth had health issues. Um, and, you know, John Adams needed a new Chief Justice. And his thought was John Jay. John Jay is the perfect uh, person. He's got experience with it. You know, he's done being governor of New York, which he thought was a better job. I'll just, you know, write him a letter. He'll take it. Well, John Jay wrote back a letter that's a fascinating letter, the, the gist of which um, uh, was the Supreme Court is never going to amount to anything. I was well out of it before, and I'm not coming back. Um, and so, you know, uh, John Adams, the Secretary of State, brought him that letter. Adams, uh, Adams, the Secretary of State, and Adams read it and said, looked up at his Secretary of State, who was John Marshall, and says, well, who should I nominate now? I guess I have to nominate you. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, and the rest is, you know, the rest is, is, is history. Um, uh, Morrison Waite was, I don't know, Grant's fifth or sixth uh, choice. A lot of corruption in the <coughs> government then. Everybody he nominated turned out to be uh, uh, involved in some financial impropriety. And he literally said to his attorney general at one point, who was that guy in Ohio who introduced me at that reunion of the Army of the Potomac? I liked him. <laughs> they, Attorney General didn't recall, but found out it was this guy named Morrison Waite, and Grant basically said, well, let's give him a try. <laughs> um, and uh, he was, uh, he was con confirmed and turned out to be a perfectly fine uh, uh, Chief Justice. Um, it's interesting, his portrait in the East Conference Room uh, has a picture of him, obviously, and then a little portrait enclosed in the portrait of Grant. So at least he was appreciative of... Uh, <laughs> Of, of Grant. And so think about that whenever you're asked to introduce somebody. You never know what <laughs> might uh, come. Edward White was, you know, became Chief Justice because although Taft had assured Charles Evans Hughes when he appointed him as an Associate Justice that he would elevate him uh, when the vacancy came available, he suddenly realized that Hughes was 47 years old and if he appointed him Chief Justice, President Taft would never be able to become Chief Justice, which is what he always wanted. His wife wanted him to be president. He wanted to be Chief Justice. So at the last minute, he decided to appoint the 65-year-old Edward White instead, um, uh, who was probably as surprised as everyone else. And it all, it all worked out. Um, uh, Taft became Chief Justice um, uh, after White you know, died on schedule. Uh, and, <laughs> and then when Ta Taft left, Charles Evans Hughes became a Chief Justice uh, uh, again, so you, you never know quite how the appointments uh, come about. Biggest challenge you see or challenges for your court going forward, Chief Justice Roberts? Um, I do think, I, I, at least for me, I obviously can't speak for the others, I do think the incredibly rapid development of uh, technology uh, that's going on right now is going to be a challenge. It's not going to be any particular area, but it cuts across uh, many different areas. Um, we had a big case a couple years ago, for example, about uh, smartphones and whether uh, police needed a separate warrant. If they arrest you, you've got a smartphone. Do they need a separate warrant to access uh, your, your phone? Um, well, you know, we have to, not all of us are as familiar with the technological devices or what different things are on them or all the capabilities. Um, and it's a challenge. Well, how does that fit with, you know, the Fourth Amendment? There weren't smartphones uh, back then. And it's one of those things where you get a lot uh, of guidance, I think, from history in that case. You know, the Fourth Amendment is there because the founders uh, 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 around this area didn't like uh, the British troops executing general warrants and kicking the door down and rummaging through their desks. Um, and if you think about it, well, right now, today, which would you rather protect if you had a choice? Do you want to keep the uh, police out of your desk without a warrant, or do you want to keep them out of your smartphone? Surely everybody would. How many would say the desk? <laughs> uh, how many would say your smartphone? <coughs> yeah, of course. It's, 
you know, because it is your desk, right? It has all your documents. It has everybody you talk to. It's everything where you've been. It's what you've been reading, everything. So it's a new technology, but you have to apply the old standards. And it's not just in that area. What, how does the First Amendment work with respect to speech on the internet? Um, if everybody's a reporter when they blog, what is the, how's the freedom of the press work in with respect to that? Uh, business areas, the intellectual property, it's, it's a, a real challenge now as the technology is developed and what is the role of the tiny little chip that somebody has that in fact controls how the entire uh, system functions. What does that have to do for monopoly analysis and, and things of that sort. So uh, I think that's going to be the challenge across the board in all sorts of different cases. I often wonder whether someone who has attained uh, the position of Chief Justice of the United States would ever entertain doing anything else. So, for instance, William Howard Taft served as Chief Justice, but was also President of the United States. And I just wonder whether you ever, you know, the primaries are just starting now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a horrifying thought. <laughs> I, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a life term, and I intend to fill out the term. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chief Justice Roberts. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thank you.